of the medium. Uh, she, with exposure and light and, and um, yeah, she, she is yeah, I don't a true pro. This doesn't portray her as a victim at, and whatever pain that yeah. she has, I think you're, you're only, the point was, is, <clears throat> and this is true as I said from my first comment about who in here is a Vivian Meyer, that everybody in this audience has pain. Every single one of you, either now or in the past, somewhere in your life, everybody, all of us have experienced this. And, and some people are able to then express it sometimes, or maybe it's a little part, it helps you know, create that spark for your art or whatever. But yeah, I, don't, I don't think it's, you know, we don't like these photographs because of, we wouldn't need to know any of the backstory actually to exactly. them, right? That's, that's right, right. Yeah. yeah, I think that's right, and uh, yeah, but I think, I, I think maybe what you're getting at also is just this whole notion of the outsider artist whose backstory um, and there are others, and I, I wouldn't want to necessarily, I wouldn't want to diminish their, their work, um, but there are, are outsider artists who have gotten attention, and the, the biography is kind of inseparable from the work, where the work is like, you know, clearly an outgrowth of whatever um, pain, trauma, etc. they have experienced. Um, and I would say Vivian uh, does not belong in that category at all. I kind of hate that. I, I hate that label of outsider artist. Anyway. So a question. We have, we have time uh, for one uh, last. Uh, uh, let's give the microphone to somebody else. One last question. And did, did you tell the audience at the beginning what you do for your day job? I am not. Okay. <laughs> so but, oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, Charlie is the uh, producer, showrunner of um, a show on Comedy Central that I don't see any 12 to 16 year olds um, on there. <laughs> but for those of you who have a, a healthy 12 to 16 year old inside of you, it's a show called uh, Tosh 2.0. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> and see, right here. All those songs of joy. Did I describe that correctly? Yes, 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 Tosh 2.0. Um, I, uh, uh, Tosh, yeah, yeah. I, ap I apologize for, uh, for what I've made you watch. No, I <laughs> Um, okay, who has the last question? Or, or let's make it the best one, and then who, and where's the one? you decide. Right here. Okay. Speed round. You always end with a speed round. And the light. Okay. Is okay. It, if you ask it quickly, I'll get the other two in. It's just a simple one. When was the last photograph you could tell that she took? Uh, I. It's not in the film. Um, we know that she took. Uh, we know that she bought film as late as 2004. Wow. Um, so uh, quite close to the end of her life. And then I think the last that we've actually seen, I think, is from uh, 1999 or 2000. Yes, quickly. It's such a wonderful film, a great story, and you told it so well. I wonder, I know we don't have much time. On a nuts and bolts level, just as John has to wade through tens of thousands of negatives and see what's there, how do you approach this story and construct this film, both as you're going along, deciding who to interview, who to shoot, and then once you have all this material spread out in front of you, her work as well as what you shot with John, how do you figure out the structure of how do we tell the story chronologically, emotionally? I noticed a lot of the negative things about her, the more questionable things about her, you put more toward the end, so perhaps we're not as influenced by that at the early part of the film. How do you even begin to approach telling the story as well as you did? Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, those, you know, those are the, the those are the things that keep you up at night, and the things that keep you working on a film for three and a half years. I mean, I watched, I watched Michael do it, um, and so I guess I, I, tried to emulate um, my mentor, uh, and really, I, I mean that, and uh, down right down to uh, to the same note cards on the board system. Um, and moving the cards same around. Colors. Oh yeah, yeah, same color. Code. And um, you know, and, and to to literally to to have ideas of scenes and what they mean and what they represent and how they fit together. And what I learned from Michael is that everything doesn't have to neatly fit into a single narrative. You can have things that may seem like they don't quite belong. Like why is Bob Eubanks? in the movie about, about job loss in Flint, Michigan, 
or why is the pets are meat lady there? Does, don't these things kind of like stick out, but not about the plant closing per se? Or why the story about um, here Ben Harper laid off uh, from his job describing hearing the, the Beach Boys song, Wouldn't It Be Nice, on the radio, and then cutting to the footage. How can you do that in a documentary? Is it still called a documentary when you do that? When you make this beautiful, artful thing that gives you a pit in your stomach? I learned those things from Michael and watching Michael's films, and I tried to do something that would evoke those same feelings. So things like the story um, uh, in Southampton uh, that the woman tells, she barely, she doesn't remember Vivian, she was there as kind of a summer girl, she was barely ever there, um, so she doesn't have much to say about Vivian, but she talks about her, uh, her maid and cook, uh, who's working with her now, and so what it, sh and she says, uh, I speak very little Spanish, and she speaks very little English, we get along perfectly. <laughs> That to me said everything, and then the, and then the, the woman is reading Michael's book, uh, Stupid White Men. You know that was just that was a gift that had to, that had to go in the movie. So because it said because it said so much about the issues of class. When Vivian shoots um, the family, uh, the father talking to uh, the gardener on uh, the front lawn and pointing out the, the weeds. And Need to be picked, and then Vivian pans across to find the one of the children pushing a toy lawnmower across. Vivian gets it; she's telling the story, and so that you know those things had to had to go in, and yet that's not what the film is uh, is about. So so those things have to kind of hang off of a narrative thread that is, you know, that is really a detective story. It's a story of trying to uh, understand who was this person, how did she uh, uh, create this incredible work while not living um, openly as an artist, leading this kind of d d double life. So there's kind of unraveling that mystery. Um, and then, so that's kind of the A story, the main story that had to be told throughout the film. Um, and as you say, uh, maybe it helps to like Vivian before you are troubled by Vivian, um, just in terms of storytelling, uh, not necessarily in terms of the chronology, but in this case, the chronology more or less lines up, and she was, I think, in general, a better nanny early on and was more troubled later. So, um, so those, th and, then, and then the B story is really, um, uh, John's attempt to popularize Vivian's work, his, his kind of David versus Goliath uh, struggle against uh, these institutions. He, he finds the work, he tries to get the tape modern and the, the artist to MoMA interested, the doors are shut, but he's going to mount the show anyway, and so, you know, maybe that's the equivalent of Michael trying to get uh, Roger Smith to come and see uh, you know, to come and see the, the devastation that he's caused. It helps to have a protagonist yeah. in, in the film. So I think those, those were some of the things that... that yeah, I have two thoughts. To, I'm sorry to wrap this up in 30 seconds. Uh, by the way, I never went to film school. Instead, I watched Michael's <laughs> movies and, and, uh, and the movies of others, um, of, of course, and there are a bunch, but that, that's, that was what we were trying to do. Um, I um, I didn't know, I went to a year to find you them. That was it. So I, I dropped out of school. I think one of the things that has helped me do what you described, that kind of filming and editing and whatever, and, and seeing that sometimes the B story is really the story, or what's going on in the peripheral, mm -hmm. is maybe informs us more about the truth than looking at things spot on and yeah. following. Now we go here in the story, then we're supposed to go here, and then we're supposed to and I think one of the best things I did was drop out of school because I think if I'd stayed in college or gone, you know, to, I don't know, whatever I was going to do, but, you know, you have to write all those papers and you're regurgitating stuff back to the teacher the way that, you know, he or she wants to hear it. And, 
And I got to avoid that. I got to escape that in a way. I mean, it, it cost me. I didn't, I didn't make my, I didn't make my first film for any money until I was 35. So 17 years of my adult life, you know, kind of a little bit of a hard scrabble. But, um, um, but I was happy. And I, uh, I think that helped me. And the other thing is, when Roger and Me came out, I was uh, vilified by the old school documentarians and and they were just horrified by the what I did. And it even just introduced humor into such a serious subject. And um, and they were, you know, uh, famously, you know, Roger was not nominated uh, for the Oscars as Who Dreams was it? There was a whole spate of films in there. That, um, but they also wouldn't allow me into the Academy for 13 years, um, the Motion Picture Academy. And I think we're socialized, including me, in a way where if you get that kind of abuse from the community that you want to be part of, maybe next time you'll pull it back just a little. Maybe next time you'll, just, you know, why am I going to piss on them? Yeah, let's do it, do it the way everybody else. I don't know, now that I'm sitting here listening to you, and this is the first time I've had this thought. What was it in my head that didn't make me conform at least just a little bit so I would get some love from the people that do what I wanted to do instead of their rejection and uh, criticism and, and vilification? And I look back now, I, I gotta go think about this because I don't know how I did, how I resisted that and just decided to keep marching to my own drummer. So that only for Columbine and Fairhaven and all these things would eventually come Well, I think, you, uh, I think you did a kind of end run around, uh, around that um, and got approval from audiences. And obviously, uh, you know, people responded to a lot of different things. Um, so, yeah. and, and, then, and, then, and then maybe, you know, the more conventional wisdom changed and now, you know, now uh, I would say um, in those kinds of films, that that's, that is what filmmakers aspire to make, are, are films that experiment, play with the tradition. Um, yeah? No, I know. I'm for, I've, been live, I've been able to live long enough to see the flip occur yes. to where, as opposed to the vilification, it is, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I get, yes, yeah. I'm sure the audience, yes, the audience, um, the people responded. Yeah. And the people who, who, when they pulled them coming out of the theater, 99 out of 100 had never been to a documentary in a movie theater. And so it was just wonderful. It was just like, how did this happen? People who would never even think about the documentary in the theater. Yeah, and that, and that would be, I guess that would be the last thing was that um, I knew from the moment I was involved in the film that I, want, I wanted this to be seen in the theaters, that I wanted this it to be... It should be seen with the crowd, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that oh, yeah. this, this should be a, a narrative feature, this should be a documentary feature, seen in a, in a, in a movie theater with, uh, with an audience and see these incredible images on the big screen like that. Um, and it's just, I just thought, it's, it's such a great story. If we, if we tell it right, it can be kind of a great roller coaster ride. Um, and made people feel like they're that, like they made a discovery. Um, and it'll just look as John did. It'll never look this good on TV screen, no matter how good your LED is. It just you're, you're watching it on 50 foot uh, screen. So, well, hey, those of you who stuck around, thank you so much for this. And thank you, Charlie. Just for coming here today. Let's hear it all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.